Living Church. I'm so blessed to be a part of New Life Church. I'm blessed by every one of you. And I always count it as a privilege when I get the opportunity to preach the gospel. And I'm thankful to God for this opportunity. And I'm even thankful to Pastor Lawrence who has given me this opportunity to share the word of the Lord this morning with you. And, but before I say anything else, I want to answer one thing by myself. A question that has been frequently asked by most of the church members that, Ankit, when are you finishing your studies? It has been asked, they have been asking me since I think 2016, the year I came in. And since then, every weekend, sometimes I'm so straight out, stressed out with my assignments, and I come in, I think this is my weekend, I should not think about my theological studies. And then I step in, people ask, when are you finishing your studies? When are you finishing your studies? So I have the answer with you by the support and by the grace of Lord Jesus Christ and the support of family, friends, New Life Church, pastors, I have finished my studies and I have a proof with myself. Here's my picture. Uh, with that, I'm also thankful for the church staff. I didn't expect them to come at my graduation service because I just expected people to come for the dinner because all Malaysian people, they love food. So I know they will definitely come for the dinner. But I think I was surprised. They all came here, Pastor Lawrence and Dilipi, my parents, and then also the church staff was there. So I'm so blessed. I don't get flowers, you know. This was my first time <laughs> to get the flowers. So I'm so blessed. I'm really thankful for that. So I really count it as a blessing. So my three years of this theological training programs in MBS has really been a blessing in my life. So I really, I'm really thankful for the church that has given me this opportunity to do my studies. And I would like to take this time and also thank personally the Pastor Lawrence and MD Lippi because they have been hosting me for a long three years. I think it's not easy, right, to host someone in their house on weekends, every weekend. And they have handed over their keys to me whenever I want to come in, I can come in. Whenever I want to go out, I can go out. It's not easy. If you think it's easy, you must try one. You must allow someone to stay with you for three years. So I really want to thank them, thank Pastor Lawrence and the Lippi is not around. So I'm really blessed. And with that, I also want to thank him because uh, I used to follow him and I used to go for his dinners or lunch. So he used to get me along. And he has two favorite spots. One is McDonald's and one is banana leaf rice. So whenever he goes, I follow him. And, and one thing that I don't even have to pay, he picks up all my bill. So I'm so privileged and I'm so thankful for his kindness and generosity. So I think being a church, we should really clap for Pastor Lawrence and appreciate what he has contributed in my life. With that, I'm also thankful to Pastor Hawk because I've been staying with him on weekends also. So I'm also blessed. It's not that I was stressed with Pastor Lawrence. It was just sometimes I have to play with kids, release my stress. So I used to stay with Pastor Hawk. <laughs> and with that, you know, I had a list of names of the people on my script. But I said, if I forget someone, then I will be in trouble. So I really want to thank each one of you who has been a support to me. You have been showing your love and concern and care. So I'm really blessed. So I really count it as a blessing. So thank you very much, yeah. And over the past three years in seminary, I have made some good friends, and they're all from different nations, and I will miss them, I will miss my studies, and hope they also miss me if I was not so annoying. So it, it was really a good journey for me. So this morning, I really want to share you an awesome story from the Gospels of Mark, chapter 24 from, chapter 24 from, uh, chapter five from verse 24 until 34. And the way the Gospel of Mark, he portrays the stories in his account, is quite unique. They're quite catchy, they're quite inspiring and quite encouraging. And he has the ability to cut down the sh stories and come straight to the point. And I assume that we all like short stories. And if not short stories, I think we all like short sermons. We want the preacher to fit his short straight to the point. So I think I want to encourage you that we must read the word of the Lord. It's very inspiring. It's very encouraging. The moment you start reading the passage, the moment you start reading the text, it will inspire you. It will encourage you. So we must take the privilege to read the word of the Lord every day in our life. It's not boring. It's very inspiring. And as you read, I believe that it will consume you with fire to do something awesome in your life, to do something great in your life for the glory of the living God. So I want to encourage you, read the word of the Lord. It's inspiring and it's encouraging, and it will lead you to right things in your life. Uh, so let me share to you about this unnamed woman in this Gospels account, chapter 5, verse 25, 34. And I picked up this passage because a few months ago I was reading this text, 
And the moment I was reading this text, I started meditating upon it. And I started to dig more about this passage. I was really encouraged. I was blessed. I was inspired and I was challenged. And I hope and I believe as I share this passage with you, the Holy Spirit will convict you and also inspire you and encourage you and also challenge you to do something great in your life. So let me just read the text before I get into my sermon. From verse 24, this is chapter 5, verse 24 to until 34, Gospels of Mark. So Jesus went with him, and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. And now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. And immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the afflictions. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around the crowd and said, Who have touched my clothes? And the disciples said that they know no because of the multitudes of the people around them. And then he looked around and, and he saw. And then this woman, she came fearing and trembling before the Lord, and she confessed that it was her that has touched the garment of Jesus. And then Jesus said to the woman, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. So today, this morning, from this passage, I'm going to talk about courage that we need to have when we go through disappointments and discouragements in our life. And that's how I have titled my sermon, Moving with Courage from our Corners of Disappointments and Discouragements in Our Life. Sometimes we are so much caught up in that very corner of discouragements and disappointments. We want to quit. We don't want to strive and thrive in our life. We just want to quit. But sometimes I think we need to have courage in our life in order to face our difficulties and challenges and disappointments. So we can get to the very destiny that we are looking for, the very breakthrough that we are looking for in our life. So that's what I'm going to share from this text. You know, the first thing that we see in the text is a big problem. In verse 25, which Mark defines as a sickness that this unnamed woman has been facing for long 12 years. According to the text, she has this continuous flow of blood for 12 years, a blood hemorrhage problem, not just for a few weeks, not just for a few months, but for long 12 years. Disappointments, discouragement, problem, sickness that has been lasting for 12 years. Can you imagine what would have been the dominant thought in the mind of this woman that when she was facing this kind of challenge in her life for long 12 years, do you think she could have this mental strength to think that, no, even though this problem has lasted for so long, still I can hope for something good. Still I can hope for something better in my life. Still I can hope for some breakthrough in my life. You think she would have that kind of mental strength in that very situation? How about us? If we go to such kind of problem in our life. It may not be for 12 years, I think it's too long. It may not be six years, I think it's still too long. Maybe three years, two years, one year, or a few months. As for me, I think even if I go through such kind of discouragement and disappointment and problem or such sickness for six months, I think my first dominant say would be that I want to quit. I want to quit over my situation because I've been so long caught up in this corner of discouragement and disappointment, I can't think of something good to happen in my life. I can't hope for something good to happen in my life. Therefore, I want to quit over the very situation that I've been caught in. Or maybe there are some other people, they may have the tendency to think that they want to commit a suicide. Because this problem, this discouragement have been lasting so long in their life. It can lead them to think that they want to quit and they want to commit a suicide. But I think that's not the way. We should have some courage in the very disappointment and in the very discouragement kind of situation. Even if we are going through such kind of sickness for many years, we should have some courage to face that very problem in our life. And sometimes these problems may not be just external things. It could be also some kind of a mental challenge in your life. It can be some kind of pressure by high powers, by the culture that can dominate you, that can push you to feel bad, to feel painful, to feel isolated, separated, and rejected, and broken in your life. And they may push you in the very corner where you feel all the discouragement and disappointment. The pressure can be so strong. Have you experienced that kind of a pain in your life? I think we all go through such kind of challenges, disappointments, and discouragement in our life. 
that can reject us, that can separate us, that can break us, that can push us into the corner. And that's how sometimes life can throw rocks on us. It can be so horrifying. And you know, coming back to this woman, this unnamed woman in this story, it was not just about her being, being getting, going through that kind of physical disability, that pain for long 12 years. It was much more that this woman had to face. It was about her being rejected by the very culture she was living in. It was about her being isolated by the culture. It was about her being separated by the culture. It was about her being to put to shame by the very culture she was living in. It's like the culture has pushed this woman into the very corner where she faced a lot of challenges, disappointments, and discouragement in her life. Sometimes, the culture of today can be so bad, so horrifying. Therefore, the church of today need to realize what is kingdom culture all about. The, the culture about justice, where we can stand for the weak people. But nowadays, the weakest are the most vulnerable in the community. And I think God is not pleased for that. We need to stand for kingdom culture that is of justice, where we look for weak people, where we help them instead of intimidating them and pushing them in the very corner. With that, let me also share with you why this woman had to go through this rejection, this separation, this isolation in her life. Why she had to stay in that corner where she was separated. You know, according to the Jewish culture, when a woman, she faced this menstruation problem, she's defined as an unclean woman. She's not supposed to communicate with the community. She's not supposed to communicate with her family, if she has a husband, if she has children, if she has kids. She's just supposed to stay by herself. And even after when she recovers, they still want her to be alone for another seven days. And after seven days, only then she can come back to the community, to her family. That's how horrifying the culture was of that time. It's so bad. I mean, instead of helping that woman, she's already facing that problem for so many years. Instead of helping her out, they're pushing her into the corner where she feels more isolated, more broken, more rejected, more separated in her life. So instead of helping her, they are pushing her in that very corner in her life. With that, I think we can imagine now, for this woman, this problem was just not for a few weeks. It was not just for a few months. It was for long 12 years. She had to face this cultural intimidation for long 12 years. No family, no friends, no one around her because of the culture and the duration that was so wrong, so intimidating, that has pushed her into the corner. And I think all this stuff, all these problems and discouragement have really made this woman make, feel very angry and upset. And metaphorically speaking, I would say that long 12 years of pains and cultural intimidating rules has pushed her into the corner. That's why I titled my sermon. Sometimes we need to learn when we are pushed into the corners of our discouragements, our disappointments. What are we going to do with that? Are we going to stay there? Are we going to quit? Or we can hope again, we can dream again in that very situation? But here, what all women in the church need to catch up. I think even guys can catch up. This woman is not going to quit in that very disappointment, in very discouragement. She is going to fight with her situation. She is hoping for something good to happen in her life. She's dreaming for something good to happen in her life. She's looking forward for her breakthrough in her life. She has a mindset that she is not going to quit. This woman is really courageous and she is an awesome woman. And that's my first point. Don't quit. Even when you go through such kind of discouragement and disappointments in your life and you're pushed in that very corner, don't quit in that very situation. You must have the mental strength to persevere, to be strong and be courageous and look forward for something great, something good to happen in your life. You must dream again. You must believe again in your life. But you must not choose to quit. You must have courage in your life. And you know, now I can name this unnamed woman. It's a very simple name. I call this woman the courageous woman. Why? Because she wants to fight with that situation. She wants to fight with her discouragement. She wants to fight with her disappointments. She wants to fight with her intimidation of the culture. And she's just fighting by herself all alone. Sometimes I think church is a blessed place because we can fight together. We can pray for our, our problems. We can fight together. But for her, she has to fight again, fight against all those problems just by herself. And in the following verse 26, we see that she did that. 
she went out to seek help or to seek cure by the physicians and the doctors. And I can imagine and I can assume how would this woman would have gone to the very doctors and physicians because she cannot openly go out because according to the Jewish culture, she's supposed to be by herself. And if she goes out and someone looks at her, she can be stoned to death. So she really has to play on her life in order to get her breakthrough because she had a mindset that she is not going to quit in the very discouragement, in the very sickness, in the very disappointment in her life. She wants to chase for her breakthrough in her life. She is not going to quit on her situation. You know, my journey in MBS had been good, but along the journey, I also had some challenges because I'm not an academic person. And I'm just a running man who ended up in theological seminary. So I really had to go through challenges because sometimes the scholarly works are so, so good. And you really have to have a great intellect, which I think I lacked somewhere. So I really had to struggle. And, and on the very first year, I wanted to quit. I didn't want to persevere. I didn't want to do, study those scholars. I just wanted to go back home. I think by the encouragement of Pastor Lawrence, my parents, and even some lecturers, they told me, no, you should continue to persevere. I think you can do it. Uh, and with that, when I used to read all those scholars, and when, I was, and when I was in the library, and when I used to read all those scholars, I used to get frustrated because I was not able to understand what they are trying to say. And the first thought that used to come in mind, I want to burn this whole library. So if there's no library, there are no assignments, I can go back home. And that was my dominant thought. And, and you know, it's fair enough because these scholars could have said something in a very simplified way, but it will really complicate your life. I mean, you can, you can just simplify things and we can understand, but they really complicate things. And then you have to read them over and over. You have to burn your nights. But I think we need to persevere. We need to have a mindset that we are not going to quit. And at the end of the day, when you finish all your assignments and all your grades are okay, I think you really feel awesome. You really feel joyful about it. And even your perspective for the library also changes. Now you, you fall in love with the books. Even when you don't have assignments, you still want to read more books. And I think it's worth, it's worth doing theological studies. There is great peace. So I think maybe some of you can pick up that challenge and go to a Bible seminary, consult Pastor Lawrence, and see how it works. It's really a blessing. And you know, even for the world-class athletes, uh, they have to go through certain hardships and certain challenges when, before they can get to the very place where they are aiming for, they are looking for. And when they get there, when they become world champion, isn't it awesome? It's so pleasing, right? So do we need to have that kind of mindset that no matter what kind of discouragement I'm going through, no matter what kind of disappointments I'm going through, no matter what kind of a challenge I'm going through, I'm not going to quit. I'm going to persevere in my life. We need to learn that in our life. But sometimes, in that very journey, we still face a lot of disappointments and discouragements. You may, you may encounter some people in your life that can poke a thorn in your flesh, right? I mean, maybe you have experienced that before in your life. So when you are trying to get off that situation, where you have the mindset that I'm not going to quit, and you even try, you try to get off that situation, the discouragement and disappointment. And when you try, there can be some people around you, they will make you feel that, no, I think you should quit. You can't make it. Go back in very discouragement and disappointment. You're not so qualified. You are an unqualified person. I don't think so. You can do it. Have you come across those kind of people in your life? You know, similarly, this was happening with this woman in this passage. She's trying to get out of trouble. She's trying to get out of problem. She's trying to get herself a cure. And then when we see in the verse that she goes to the doctors, but then she was not able to find her cure. And the text says, even her situation grew worse. So she's trying. She's already in pain for so long years. And she's trying. She had a mindset she's not going to quit. And she's trying to get off that place. But when she tries a certain kind of source where she can tap for her breakthrough, she's disappointed again. And again, she's pushed back into the very corner where she came from. And I assume maybe those doctors would have cheated her because according to the culture, this woman doesn't have a say. And, and because of that, she can't even raise her voice. And she had spent all her money 
And it takes his situation even when worse. And even in our life, you know, sometimes we may also try to do that. We may try to persevere, we may try to strive and thrive for something great, something awesome in our life that we can hope for, or maybe we had a vision in our life. But when we tap to some source, we get disappointed. Even if we face sickness, we go to all kind of cure and we don't get those cure, we are again disappointed and discouraged and we are pushed back into the very corner where we came from. And I think that kind of situation makes us really feel that I should not dream again, I should not hope again, I should not believe again, I should not think for something good that can happen in my life because this problem has been lasting so long. And even I tried different sources, I tried to tap for my breakthrough, but nothing worked out for me. Therefore, I feel like that I want to give up. I tried before, and it had been lasting long, and I want to give up. And it could be anything. It could be a academic pressure. It could be an emotional crisis. You tried some guy, or you tried some girl, but then you were disappointed by that very person. And again, you're alone in the very corner, lonely. And then you don't want to try again. Or maybe it could be a business challenge in your life. It could be anything in your life that you face that has pushed you in the very corner that you have. Or maybe you have some vision for your church, but it didn't work out. And now you feel like it has been for a long time. Now I can't dream again for it. I can't hope again for it. I can't believe it again. Therefore, I just let go. I just quit. But I want to remind you from this story that let us be courageous. Let us not be intimidated by our situation. And let us not give up in our situation. Let us be strong and be courageous. Let us make one more move again from our disappointments and discouragement in order to get to our destiny, in order to get to our breakthrough that we have been hoping for, that we have been looking for. Let us dream again. Let us hope again. Let us, let us look forward to something good in our life that can happen. We should have this kind of mindset. You know, this woman is tough. She is courageous. She knows what she wants. Even after her disappointments and discouragements, even after she was not able to get her cure, she knows what she wants. She wants her breakthrough in her life. And she wants to fight with her situation. I think we should also learn. We need to fight with our situations in our life. Sometimes we even forget what do, what do we want as of a breakthrough. So let me ask you this morning. What do you want in your life? What are the things that you were looking for as your breakthrough in your life? That now, when you have been pushed in that very discouragement, in that very corner of disappointments, you can't hope again. You don't even know what was your vision. You don't even know what you were looking for as your breakthrough in your life. And now you have lost all your hope. But I think we need to catch this from this woman. We should not quit. We should hope again. We should believe again in that very situation. And in that very following verse 27, we see that this woman, she heard about Jesus, that Jesus is called the Son of God, and he has been healing people. It's not in the text. But what else would have this woman heard about it? I mean, would have heard about Jesus that made her mind, that made her think again, that needs, she needs to move again. But I think for her just to think that she needs to move again in order to get her breakthrough in her life, she needed to have courage again in her life. And that's my second point. Have courage in your life again. You tried something, it didn't work out. Forget about it. But have courage again and try to get where you want to go for your breakthrough in your life. You need to have courage again. And then you see that this woman, she comes out of a corner which she has been pushed by the culture. And you know, it would not have been easy for this woman. When we read verse 24 in this chapter, you see there were multitudes of people that were following Jesus. That includes Jesus' disciples. And I think they were quite influenced by Torah. And they were quite influenced by Jewish traditions. And if this woman would have shouted from far, Hey, Jesus, I've been in that very discouragement, disappointment, and very sickness. Can you please come? Help me out. I'm sick. I think this one would have not helped her out. Because if she would have shouted out, she would have been in trouble. Because the culture would have not allowed her to go and tap the garment of Jesus. And with that, maybe they could have even stoned her to death. Because she's an unclean woman, and according to the culture, she's not supposed to be in the community. But this woman, she's very clever. She's just not courageous. She's smart. She's, she would have sneaked out of the crowd. Maybe she would have a long bed sheet over her or overcoat, and she would have hid herself in that very coat, and she would have gone out and would have tapped the garment of Jesus 
to get her breakthrough. This is another thing that I want to share that sometimes in our life, we just don't need to pray. We need to move with courage in our life in order to get our breakthroughs. You know, sometimes, like for me, uh, academic studies has all been, always been a challenging for me because I don't like to study. Even since my school days, my university, when I did my bachelor's, I don't like to study at all. I hate. I just like to be on the field playing basketball or playing some kind of sports. That's what I was. But for, so I was facing difficulties in, my, in, in this process. So when I used to pray before the Lord, I used to pray, Lord, please give me your supernatural wisdom so that I can understand all this college work so that I'm able to do well in my assignments. But with that, I think just praying here may not be enough. I need to move. I need to move to the library where I can study and put my efforts. And that's how life is. Sometimes we just don't need to pray. We should pray. I believe in prayer. But with prayer, we should move with courage in our life. We need to show courage in our life. And then we see that in the following verse, 28 and until 34, that this woman, when she saw Jesus, and she said, if only I touch his garment, I shall be made well. So now you see that it was not her about just being giving up. She had a mindset. She had a mental strength that she won't quit. And she had shown her courage again. But with that, she had shown her confidence in Jesus. I mean, where did this confidence came in her from? I mean, she would have just heard about Jesus. She never, know, she never knew Jesus. She just heard about Jesus from someone, that Jesus is the Son of God, He's healing people. And then comes that faith in her. That if I just touch the garment of Jesus, this 12 years of disappointment, this 12 years of discouragement, this 12 of years of sickness will just go away. I think being the church today, how much more we need to be confident about Jesus, whom we know. We may not have the garment of Jesus, but we have something precious with us. We have the blood of Jesus that heals, restores, that casts away all kind of sickness, discouragements, and disappointments that have been lasting long in our life. So we need to be confident about the Jesus' blood. And that's my third point, having confidence in Jesus' blood. We need to come before the Lord with confidence. And we can learn from this woman. And we need to show the confidence in the blood of Jesus. There is power in the blood of the Lamb. Speak to your situation with confidence. And cast out all your dark times, your disappointments through Christ's blood. And in the following verse 29, we says, Immediately the fountain of blood was dried up. And she fell in her body that she was healed of her afflictions. And then in the following verse, Jesus came to know that someone has touched him because Jesus could feel that the power had gone out of him. And then Jesus even asked his disciples, but no one knew. Finally, the courageous woman, she confessed that it was her. And then Jesus told to this woman that, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. You know, Jesus is a gracious person. Our heavenly father is a gracious person. When Jesus told to this woman that your faith has healed you, you know, he gave two things. First, her discouragement and disappointment had been lasting long because of sickness. So when Jesus said, your faith has made you well, Jesus was referring to her physical restoration. And with that, Jesus also restored her spiritually. Two things. When she had put her confidence in Jesus, she was restored physically. And secondly, when she had put her confidence in Jesus, she was spiritually made whole. Isn't it awesome when we put our confidence in Jesus? He just doesn't, doesn't deal with physical thing that is just temporary, that will just go away within a few years. But he also restores something for eternity. That is our spiritual restoration. Isn't it awesome when we put our confidence in Christ? So we need to understand from this story, we need to have courage. We need to have a mindset that I'm not going to quit. I'm going to persevere in my life. I will have courage again in my life. And I will put my confidence and the blood of Jesus, that is a living blood that heals, that restores, that casts out every dark situation in my life. Uh, you know, a few weeks ago, I had lost my passport. And I came to realize on, one of the, on the Saturday morning, uh, I was like a headless chicken, running around everywhere, searching for my passport. I was so pressured because the following week, I had an exam. 
I had an assignment to hand over. I had one more bonus assignment to hand over. And in the same week, I was going to graduate. So I make sure my assignments and everything is done well. So I graduate, I finish everything. The so pressure was so strong on me. And the Sunday night, the following night, I realized that I have lost my passport. It's not with me anymore. And I thought next morning, Monday morning, I need to go. I need to rush to the embassy as soon as possible because within a few weeks' time, I'm flying back home. And, and I was thinking that how the procedure will go on. With that, I sent my apologies to Sister Lahing because that night I was supposed to catch up for a dinner with the pastors and Sister Lahing, but I was not able to. So I told her that because I have misplaced, I have lost my passport, I can't make it. So I'm looking for it. So if you know any procedure, can you please help me out. She says, yes, I will help you out. But in a while, she called me back and she says, okay, you're looking for the procedure and everything. I will help you out. But before that, let's pray before the Lord. Let's confidently come before the Lord. And wherever you have misplaced your passport, you will get it back. So for me, I have lost this thought of praying. I like to pray. I really like to pray. I really like to spend time with the Lord. But at that time, I was so pressured. I was so so pushed in that very place that I could not think of praying. I just thought I would just go get my travel document. And all my focus was on my assignments because I make sure my assignments are done because passport I can get back. But assignments I have to finish. So uh, the next morning, Monday morning, I, I was fasting and praying. I, I told Lord, and I won't drink anything. I won't eat anything. I will just fast and pray because I want you to supernaturally bring my passport even if I've misplaced my passport. So I'm not really good in fasting. I'm really bad. I mean, it's not an excuse. I really have to work on that thing. So until the late evening at 6.40, we have our dinner in our campus. So I told Lord, I think I can't hold this fast anymore. I'm going to go and eat food. <laughs> you take care for my passport. I'm going to have my food. So I went there. I had my food. I came back in my room. I took a nap. And then suddenly my friend comes in and he said, oh, so you have misplaced your passport. I said, yes. He said, let's check your room. I said, I have already checked my room a few times. I've checked everywhere. Even my other friend, my room, he's also checked my room a few times. What are you going to find in the room? You're going to find anything. It's misplaced now. Now we are praying for something miraculously, something should happen. But he says, no, I still want to check. So within a few minutes, he just opened up my wardrobe and my passport was there. And I was, I shouted, wow, it's a miracle. I think God, God, brought super, God supernaturally brought my passport back. But my friend says, no, it's not a miracle. You should have been careful when you were looking for your passport. I said, no, it's a miracle. Then I got another friend. I told him, hey, tell him that, that we had been searching here. It was not here. It's a miracle. He says, yes, it's a miracle. Then he says, no, both of you are wrong. It's not a miracle. You both were not careful. So from my perspective, it was a miracle. From my friend's perspective, it was just... That we were not careful. But we are not going to get into the fights and arguments that the Lord decided when he comes. But the thing is, sometimes we forget to come before the Lord with confidence when we are in need, when we are discouraged, when we are disappointed. Even for small things, we forget that we should come before the Lord with confidence. Therefore, I want to remind you and reflect from these things. We must come before the Lord with confidence for our sickness, for our disappointments, for our academic pressure, for our business, for all kinds of things. I think he's a God who loves. He, will, he cares for you and he will answer you when we put our confidence. And that's what this woman did. She had put her, all her confidence and she was restored spiritually and also physically. I think so do we should in our lives. We must have a mindset that I'm not going to quit. We must have a mindset that I will have courage again. And we must approach the Lord's throne with confidence in our life. And with that, let me show you Another awesome story from 1 Samuel chapter 17 of a young boy, I think whom you know all, his name is David. You know, Bible is full of awesome stories, inspiring and encouraging stories. I don't know why some people get tired in the word of the Lord. We must read the word of the Lord. You know, before David could get his breakthrough to have a great shifting in his life from a shepherd boy, a low profile person to a king, he had to show some courage in our life. And this guy, I think, is really an opportunitist kind of a person. He knows how to take opportunity. And he took this opportunity by slaying down this great, huge, tall, giant, ugly Goliath of Philistine army. But, you know, before that, I will say that he was not even called to pick up this challenge. 
He was not even in the King Saul's army. It was not his duty. He was not even called to do that in his life. He was not uh, called by someone or was challenged by someone that you should pick up this challenge, but he just took it by himself. But before that, you know, even David was also pushed into a corner by his family where he was assigned for just a low profile kind of a thing, which is just look after his sheep. Whereas all his elder brothers were given the privilege to serve in King Saul's army. But for him, he just was pushed into the very corner where he just was a shepherd boy. But when David was told by his father, Jesse, that go and pass his bridge at the camp, at the King Saul's camp where his brother was serving, he went there and he got interested in slaying down this giant because none of them had the courage to slay down this huge, ugly, tall, strong giant, Goliath. But when he heard that nobody is capable enough, nobody have that courage in their lives, so he says, I'm going to pick up this challenge. I will slay down this giant because nobody is able to do that. But his elder br brother, Eliab, got upset with him. He said to David, David, what are you doing here? You're supposed to be there looking after the sheep. What are you doing here? I think David, Eliab wanted David to go back to look after the sheep. Or in other words, he was telling David, David, go back into the corners where you were just a shepherd boy, where you just a little boy. Don't talk about slaying down the giants. Don't talk about bigger things. You can't do it. We are all in King Saul's army and we, don't, we can't do it. How can you do it? You're just a little boy. Just look after the sheep. And then in the following verse, we say, even King Saul told him that, David, you're just a youth. You're just a young man. You can't do it. And he said, the Goliath, the huge, tall man, is a man of war. You can't do this, little boy. Go back into the very corner where you were looking for the sheep, where you were pasturing the sheep. Don't talk about sling down the giants. Have you got that in your life before by some people around you? Or maybe some, of, some kind of thoughts came in you that you can't do it. You are just here in that corner and you cannot get to the place where you can slay down the giants of your life. You can't. Have you got that before in your life? You, you, you were pushed to discouragement and disappointments because people thought, or maybe you had a thought that you're not qualified enough to do great things in your life. And you know, if David would have heard these things, I think he would have never met his destiny. He would have never become a king. He would never have become a king. But instead, he listened to the voice of God that was stirring in him, the spirit of the Lord that gave him the confidence, the courage to slay down this giant. And in the following verse, we see that David was able to convince King Saul. Sometimes I think we also need to learn how we can convince people for something great in our life. And then he said, to the giant Goliath, that you come with all your stuff, with all your swords and spears and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord whom you have been defiling. And further we see that he was able to slay down this giant in his life. So sometimes I think even young people, if you see that it's challenge coming ahead in your life and you think you're just a youth and you can't do it, I think you must have courage to pick that challenge up, to slay down the giant, which is for God's glory. And you know, where did, where did the David's courage and confidence came from? It came from the Lord. It came from God, whom David knew, whom David knew personally, where he had built an intimacy with God, where he used to worship in spirit and in truth, where in, the, in that very corner he used to spend time with the Lord. So when you, you think when you are in the corner, don't be full of complaints and regrets. Don't carry all those painful experiences with you, but carry a heart of worship, carry a heart of praise, carry a heart of prayer in that very corner. So when the Spirit leads you, it will lead you to the very destiny where God led David and he became a king. And so does the Spirit of the Lord can do in your life. Amen? And, and that's my last point, building intimacy with God. We need to learn to build intimacy with the Lord in the very corner we have been pushed. And if you think you're not so courageous and confident person, I think I'm also not so courageous and confident person. But when I need, my, I need to have courage in my life to do something, when I need to have confidence in my life to do something, I get back to the place where I can worship the Lord, where I can pray, where I can cry before Him to fill me with His Spirit. And His Spirit is not 
of fear, a spirit is of power that can lead us to slay down the giants of a life for God's glory. And so do we should. But I think with this, we should keep one thing in mind. Let your courage and confidence may not lead you to intimidate people, culture, or anybody who is weak in the society. It should always lead you to something glorious that has to do with the kingdom culture. You know, David was just not fighting for a position. He was just not fighting for him to become a king. He was annoyed by the Philistine army. He was annoyed by Goliath because he has been defiling the name of the Lord. Therefore, it poked him. He says, now I'm going to pick up this challenge because you are defiling the name of the Lord. And that's what we need to learn. Our courage and confidence should lead us for God's ambitions, not our selfish ambitions. We need to put ourselves up to a place where the Spirit of the Lord keeps on reminding, keeps on convicting that my courage and confidence is to slay down the giants for God's kingdom, not for my selfish ambitions. Can I have the worship team? With that, I want to also share and conclude with one thing. In our discouragements, in our disappointments, in that very corner, we always look for our breakthrough. We always look for our, our stuff. We always look that something should happen with me, something good should happen with me. But you know, first thing that we should be thankful about, the greatest breakthrough that we have in our life, we have eternity that Christ has given us. And we should be thankful about that thing. We should be thankful about our salvation. And we should be thankful about our breakthrough. You know, even we were perishing in that very corner. We were given to condemnation because of our sin, but because of Christ, because of him paying that, that, that price for us, we are being redeemed. And we have been pushed, or we, have been, we are moving to the, our very destiny, which is eternal life. So with that, I want to encourage you that there are some people that they are also perishing in that very corners, the disappointments and discouragements. They don't know who Christ is. And they are perishing to internal destruction. You know, heavens and hell are not a fairy tale. They are real. And without Jesus, you cannot make to heaven. Without him, you will be led to internal destruction. And there are people, they are perishing away in the very corner. They don't know who Christ is. They don't have hope. They can't look forward for eternal life. They never have heard about Jesus. So I think you and I need to get up. We need to rise. And we need to bring that gospel in that very community, to that very people, to that very, very nation that, have been, that are perishing without knowing Christ. And if you and I, we don't go there, they will perish away. Like someone came to us, that someone brought us the good news, I think we are also responsible to bring that good news back to the very corner where our people are perishing. They are perishing, they don't have any hope. They don't know about the eternal life that is in Christ. So I think we should commit ourselves and that should be our primary focus. You know, we have a lot of needs in our life. We talk about a lot of needs. We, talk a lot of, we pray about a lot of needs that we want as our breakthrough in our life. But do you think we can take all those things to eternal life? No, we can't. What we can take to eternity is the souls that are perishing away. I will take my soul and I will take the souls of the people who are perishing away. So we need to preach the gospel and save the lost. You know, this past three years, it had been quite challenging for me. I had a lot of challenges. Rather than academic challenges, I still had challenges. And then in that challenge, you are tested because sometimes when the Spirit prompts you to preach the gospel, you don't feel like, because you're so disappointed and you're so discouraged by your situation, you don't feel like preaching the gospel to someone who's perishing away. You think it's not my business because I have a lot of discouragement in my life. I should deal with those things first. I think it would be a wrong message. Because we may not have the time to preach the gospel to souls that are perishing away. We need to preach them the gospel. And I have been preaching to many people. And sometimes people get upset. It's good for you. Gospel is good for you, not for me. So I get like very upset. Why are they saying like this? And sometimes I call myself, I'm really a shameless evangelist. Even though I don't see any results, I keep on preaching the gospel. But why? But I think when I, when I go back into the corner where I build intimacy with the Lord, the Spirit always prompts me to preach the gospel and save the lost. And people have been asking me, what I'm going to do next? You know, first thing, I didn't share this in the first service. The first thing I want to go back and do is tone myself. Because when I came in, 
I had endurance, I had strength, I had few packs. Now I've eaten so much and within this few weeks time, I'm going back with just one pack. So I need to work on it. The moment I go back, I need to work on it, my, I need to tone myself. But with that, I want to dedicate myself to what Jesus advocated in the Gospel of Luke. That the Son of Man came to seek the lost. And I think that should be our primary focus in our life. That my life, I want to dedicate to the Lord. I want to seek the lost. I want to preach the gospel. I want to save the lost. Amen. Before I pray, I want to pray for two things. First, I want to pray that let our primary focus be in our life, that I will preach the gospel with wisdom. And secondly, I want to pray about any kind of sickness that is here. We're going to cast that out in Jesus' name. We're going to come confidently before the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm going to pray. But before that, let us just sing this chorus. Let us just all stand up. And let's just lift our voices to the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Let us come before the altar of Lord Jesus Christ with confidence. Let us assess to his blood with confidence. Every sickness has to bow before his name. Every sickness has to go in Jesus' name. There shall be full healing in Jesus' name. Therefore, we come with the confidence that Jesus will heal us. If there's any sickness in your life, you should come before the Lord. Let us sing this song. Give me.